last time I was standing in front of an audience in the context of a voice conference, it was mid-November 2015 in Paris, and I had accompanied Christine Linklater, who was one of the lead voice teachers invited at the conference, and I was doing the translation job for her. The conference was taking place despite the fact that there had been a series of terrorist attacks in Paris a few days before that had left 130 people dead and uh, hundreds wounded. Where words prevail, not violence prevails, is the well-known quote from Thomas Kidd from the Spanish tragedy, unfortunately feeling very much timely still today, of course, of course, my aunt fortunately. So from the voice, a discussion of Christine Linklater voice for actors. What does it mean to free the voice? Can it mean freeing the person? I'm asking you. <laughs> because that's what I've been asking myself. <laughs> I'm an actor, I'm a theater director, and I am a DLT, which stands for Designated Linklater Teacher. My specialty is the spoken voice, how it functions, why it doesn't really work the way we would like it to work, and how to, what to do about it. I was going to say how to fix it, which is not really what I do, I think. But <laughs> what to do about it if it's not doing what we would like it to do. If one uses their voices, it's mostly because they have something to say, and whilst the voice is at the core of what I do, speaking text is the fundamental ingredient, ingredient of my teaching. And since I mostly work with actors, I link the voice work to text from an array of authors, dead or alive. And here in the UK, of course, Shakespeare is central to my work. In Belgium, where I come from, it was mostly Racine when I used classical text. I also use contemporary dramatic text and lots of new poetry. At other times, when I'm not working with actors, I meet with fellow Linklater teachers and other voice specialists. And occasionally, I explore the field of voice, physically and metaphorically, with poets in collaboration with the Ledbury Poetry Festival. I trained in the States with Christine in the early 90s, and I'm currently teaching voice at Lambda, London Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts here in London. Strangely, or appropriately, should I say, Lambda is the institution where Linklater studied to be an actor in the 50s. Her voice teacher was Iris Warren, and it's also the place Linklater went back to, recalled by Michael McOwen, the then principal of the school, who, as Christine writes in her book, Freeing the Natural Voice, he saw her potential early on. He wanted to make sure Iris Warren's specific voice teaching would not disappear with its creator, and that it would continue with someone up to the task. Christine spent six years shadowing Iris before moving to the States about 60 years ago. There she spent half a century developing the voice work initiated by Warren, and she returned to her country, her home country, um, Scotland, to create her own voice center in 2013 in Orkney Island, where this outfit comes from. <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Free the Natural Voice was written in uh, 1976, so the first book she wrote, and, but she revised it and augmented it substantially 30 years later. It's Christine's legacy, this book. From the mid-60s on, she also trained teacher, teachers, and there are now over more, I think, more than 250 teachers scattered around the world, so Linklater Voice Teacher, DLT, as I repeat. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, give you the, the names of all the countries where we, uh, we operate from. 
can use that. So mostly in America, but also the UK, Germany. So I decided to do that in one breath to also tease myself, right, <laughs> as a voice coach. So Germany, Italy, Malta, Mexico, South Korea, Taiwan, Poland, Russia, Belgium, Canada, Finland, France, Austria, Spain, Switzerland, China, Ireland, and Iceland. <laughs> it wasn't that good, in fact, but I did. <laughs> okay. So um, I hope I have not forgotten any country. I'm just reading it. Despite Christine's death three and a half years ago, her work, the voice work, lives on and continues to be transmitted to students in many institutions and to new teachers like David, who is uh, willing to become a DLT. In fact, I mm -hmm. mentioned that. So it's public now. You have to do it. <laughs> Um, okay, so in this lecture that I decided to rename this lecture to Unpretentious Talk because I think it corresponds more to who I am and how I speak. I'm using myself as an example to explore the progression of the linklator voice exercises and to demonstrate how the voice work freed my voice. Disclaimer, sharing an opinion using oneself as example is a common practice in the voice world. As Dudley Knight mention, mentions in his essay, Standards from 2000, most of the theater voice teacher's research library resides in the cumulative experiences of the individual shared colleagues through thousands of interactions with students and other theatre professionals. So I kind of adhere to that uh, idea. But I will also question the potential the voice work had to free me, thus the title of this talk. What does it mean to free the voice? Can it mean freeing the person? Can I free myself through my voice? Did I? Da -da -da -da. Um, so I call myself a speaking voice specialist and I guess others have seen me like that for quite a while now. Um, what always strikes me is how surprised people are when they understand that their voices live in their bodies. When they are able to experience the sensation of their voices inside their bodies. When they can look at their voices touch their voices, their vibrations. The experience most people have is an awareness of the sounds of their own voices outside of their bodies, that their voice starts in the throat and escapes through their mouth. And that is it. Exploring the sensation of the voice in the body, looking at its source, at its, source its journey through the torso and its connection with the bones of the ribs, the spine, the cheeks, the skull, is a surprise for most new voice explorers and often an inspiring revelation. And it was certainly for me. I remember myself, age 19, how disconnected I felt from my voice. I, I was hearing it outside of me and I had no way to control it. It lived out of my mouth, escaping my authority. Listening to it was not helpful. It made things much worse. I was hating what I heard when I dared speaking. Shutting down. I was mostly silent. And for a young actor, it is a challenge. I met Christine five years later when I was 24. And I learned that my imagination and my emotions are the controllers of my voice. If I wake up my imagination I, and if I train it, if I connect to my emotions and all emotions are valid, they will do their magic and my voice will reveal my thoughts when I speak. I, it will not describe what I say. My voice will be transparent, revealing. This is one of the founding principles of this work. It took me a while to get there, to feel that my voice lived in me, and even more revolutionary, 
that the words I speak live there too. And that took me even longer. The next question comes quickly rumbling out. How can I control the way I use words? How I modulate phrases? How can I speak the way my character speaks? No answers yet. I'm 24, and at 24, I am a lucky working actor. Neurotic, anxious, pressurized, tired, worried about my breathy voice, losing it. Could I really sustain this career? I speak sur le souffle, on air, on the breath, as we say in French. Headaches on stage plague me, and I don't know what to do about it. I need to add that my Belgian, Belgian actor's training at the time, and I'm talking about 1980 to 1983, 40 years ago, <laughs> We had almost no voice training. Nobody had helped me to become aware of the physical tensions I was holding. I had been told countless times that I was too nervous, that I needed to relax. <laughs> but given very few specific exercises to support these demands. The good thing about the Conservatoire de Liège, where that was my school, was that we had a passionate lead teacher who was um, René Henault, you okay? René Henault, who was willing to address the gaps in our training. And he was the one who invited Christine in 1985. He had invited her before in the 60s at the Ansas, an acting school in Brussels, and again in the 70s, yes, yes, already in Liège. There is, I think, research to do around that, the connection between Christine and Belgium. Anyway, that's for another talk. And <laughs> René was the one, one of the one people who uh, supported me when I deci decided to continue this work. And back in 85, I was doing quite the equivalent to a master's in acting. I was performing professionally, but back at the conservatoire for specific activities. That is when I met Christine, and that is when I understood through meticulous observations that I was holding my breath whilst I was listening, trying to listen to my partners on stage. It was the main cause, cause of my headaches. I had to learn to breathe again, and much more, of course, but let us stay with the subject of breath. So, of course, I was breathing in 1985. <laughs> But holding my breath, squeezing muscles to stop myself, stiffening my belly, clenching my teeth, my jaw, habits I had accumulated through my young life at the time to protect myself from expressing myself freely. Holding breath is often about protecting oneself. I, I feel like I'm speaking like it's a big, important message I'm translating. I'm, transmitting, but it is, yes it is, so that's why I speak uh, So, where did I grow, you wonder, in which stifling culture, which oppressive family? So, here is a little story um, of a habitual Sunday lunch at home. Some of it is in French, approximate translation provided. It's called Sunday potage, with a little help from Alfred de Musset. <laughs> I loved your hands. I loved your fingers, mother, when you scraped the carrots, washed away the soil from the leeks, chopped the celery, and grated the potatoes. I remember your fingers, red under the cold running water from the tap, I remember your tears when peeling the onions. I loved your soups. On Sunday, you cook chicken for lunch, and after the meal, our father cut, peeled, and cored apples. 
Then he distributed them, Christ sharing bread with his disciples. And my sister, my brother and I ate them avidly, if not religiously. You mother were back in the kitchen, behind closed doors, your hands scraping, throwing, doing the washing up, while in the dining room. It was poetry. The story of the pelican sacrificing his life for his offsprings was one of our father's favorites. Lorsque le pelican, lassé d'un long voyage, dans les brouillards du soir, retourne à ses roseaux, ses petits affamés courent sur le rivage en le voyant au loin s'abattre sur les eaux. Translation. When the pelican, exhausted by his long journey, returns to his reeds, in the night's mist, his hungry children run to the shore, shaking their beaks on their ugly throats. But, pour toute nourriture, il apporte son cœur. The only food he has to offer is his heart. Partageant à ses fils ses entrailles de père, sharing his entrails with his children, sublime by love, cradling his pain, the pelican looks at his bloody chest and dies, <laughs> drugs with tenderness and horror. Our father enjoyed himself enormously. We were glued to our seats. He was the hunting birds. We were his hungry children, devouring him alive. A more or less conventional Northern European family. <laughs> the mother at home, the working father who enjoyed the sound of his own voice and who monopolized speech. That had an impact. You could still hear it. <laughs> Undoing unnecessary physical habits is what made it possible for me to reconnect to the whole of my voice, releasing tension in my abdomen, my neck, thus my throat, in my tongue, my lips, limbering my soft palate to create more space in my mouth for the sound to travel, encouraging the feel of breath and sound in my spine, seeing, visualizing, feeling the specific experiences brought me, feeling, no, I jumped a line, sorry. Seeing, visualizing, feeling the vibrations of my voice inside my chest, my face, my skull, all those specific experiences brought me to reconnect fully with my voice, the voice I knew I had as a child. I forgot to say, I was a soloist singer in my childhood, part of the tiny choir we had in the village where I lived. Not so long ago, I listened to an old tape and heard the pure, strong, sustained sound of, of my 10 years old voice with great excitement. Yes, I used to have a voice. But before those changed, changes happened, I, went, I want to go back to 1985 and my first encounter with Christine it's Liège, Belgium, January. It's about breath, it's about emotion. I've been invited to join a voice workshop. This Scottish woman, Christine something, is coming to Liège. I've agreed to participate. It's free. <laughs> I have voice problems on stage. We gather in a large, uncomfortable room with an old miserable rug on the floor, the heating doesn't work properly. This is perfect for voice work, my God! <laughs> there is this woman with very short hair, dark eyes, blue clothes. It must be her, the Christine. I'm sure we're going to have to say who we are and why we're here, I don't want to speak. I barely listen to her. 
I mumble a few words when it's my time, a few words when it's my time, looking down. Is she listening to me anyway? Up on our feet! Oh, I'm aching. My legs, my back, my neck, my glasses keep, keep slip, slipping along my nose. My sweater looks horrible. The work is very physical. <sighs> Make sure your weight is evenly balanced on both your feet, said she. Well, I don't really. If it is, I'm trying. I think I. Now drop down through your spine, vertebra after vertebra. Oh, it's excruciatingly painful. I'm trembling, head downwards. My neck is killing me. Now, feel the need for a sigh. Just in breath, no sound yet. A sigh of relief. What? What relief? <laughs> a sigh of preferably pleasurable relief. What is this all about? There is absolutely no pleasure in here. I feel terrible, noxious, I'm going to faint. Now, come back, slowly uncurling your spine. Does she say something? I'm confused. Keep breathing. Okay, I'm back, I'm standing up. Oh, now I have to stretch my arms towards the ceiling or let your elbows drop, your wrists drop. Oh, what time is it? How long has this been going on? <laughs> I had no breakfast this morning. Let your head drop. I need some coffee. We're dropping down the goddamn spine again. <laughs> Why am I doing this? It hurts my lower back. Go on to the squat and just let yourself go on to the floor on your back. Are we going to do the voice work or not? Close your eyes. Let the muscles of your back spread on the floor. Is there going to be a break? Become aware of the tiny involuntary movement in the middle of the body. I'm tired. Let your lips fall apart and feel the air coming in, then going out. I'm restless. Feel the air on your lips. Her voice is approaching. On your tongue. Feel the cold air entering your body. I feel a hand on my stomach. Comforting. Something is happening. Oh, I yawn. More air comes in. Let the muscles of your stomach go, drop to gravity. And I sigh. Now turn your attention on the outgoing breath. The hand is gone, but I keep feeling its warmth. I feel like crying. I cry. I breathe. I wrote those memories using English much later. <laughs> when living here in the UK, I did share them with Christine. She laughed and cried a little too. Breath and the natural rhythm of breathing, another specificity of this voice work. Can we observe our breathing patterns without interfering? Can we relax the breathing musculature so that, and this is the best quote I can use from the yellow book that I didn't bring with me, unfortunately, but you can find it online. The actor's breathing musculature must be able to pick up rapidly shifting thoughts and feelings engendered by an imaginatively created state of being. For the actors who value truthful expression, breathing control must be diverted from muscles to impulses. The ultimate controls are imagination and emotion. Can I let my body breathe? Can I observe this happening? After a week of dropping down through my spine, sighing, and experiencing the connections between my breath, my emotions, my voice, and words, I was hooked to this world. work. Christine's hand on my belly was there to make me aware of what was going on. It helped me to relax 
and to connect to how I felt, to sigh through how I felt. I mentioned sighing and I need to focus just for a moment on the sigh of relief we use in this work. Why sigh with relief? Not boredom, commonly associated with the idea of the sigh. Well, the best way to exercise the actor's breathing musculature is to connect or reconnect thinking, breathing and feeling, to generate real impulses of relief that teach us we do not need to push to express a thought, an emotion. Speaking is relief. To go back to the text and what hooked me to the voice work, I had practiced a speech from Goethe's Faust when Marguerite is in prison. I use Marguerite because of course I was doing all that in French and Christine was also doing the, vo the voice work in French at the time. And I had turned the dialogue between Faust and Marguerite when she's in prison into a monologue, in fact. So that was the text I presented when I was doing the voice work with Christine in this workshop. So Christine had me speak the text was dropping down my spine and gently rolling my neck around. With her hands, she loosened my neck, helped me to relax my torso muscles. My throat opened, and when I spoke Marguerite's lines, I could feel the breath, my breath, and the voice, my voice, totally connected to the center of my torso. The words flew easily through me, no effort involved, connected to the emotions contained to the story, connected to my emotional life. It was effortlessly truthful. And I was happily upset that day. That same year, I wrote a monologue that I then performed for an audience. I had something of a voice. There were things I wanted to talk about, certainly. I was still suffering from my breathy voice, but I was becoming aware of tensions in part of my body and started to play with some exercises to relieve those tensions, release those tensions. I was seeing a possible light at the end of my tunnel. So these changes didn't happen in one week, of course. It took me about three years. After the first voice and text workshop in Liège uh, with Christine, I was lucky enough to travel to the US a couple of times. The first time Linklater offered me a grant for one month long workshop with Shakespeare and Company in the winter of 1987 and the other was in the whole summer of 98 again with Shakespeare and Company, this company that she founded with Tina Packer uh, in the Berkshire. She founded that company in the early 70s and I think Tina wrote a book recently about some of that work. So Tina is still around and the Shakespeare and Company still exists. Um, so there I spent many weeks working on my voice, my acting, and familiarizing myself, I'm still trying to familiarize myself with the English language, slowly reconnecting with the whole of my voice, its clarity, its full range, full and full power. And by the end of that summer, I remember thinking, that's it, I can embody any type of living creature, young or old. I had freed my actor's voice. This is, of course, completely subjective, a completely subjective experience. No proof exists. But was I free? And what does it mean to be free? Freedom. So, freedom cannot just be an individual matter. I will suggest here that I freed my actor's voice through this work. The characters I portrayed were somehow freer than me. I could use my voice fully to embody them, but that I was still living with oppressive relationships in a somewhat oppressive culture, trying to shape me in ways I did not enjoy, pressed to do things I didn't really want to do, struggling in my own life to use my voice and claim independence. The characters I, port I portrayed were somehow freer than me. So much later, 
after years of soul searching, some, some useful, useful therapy, and the help of very special friends, I gained freedom. But it is a constant search, a constant struggle. Freedom of the self has many social and political implications. It's not something one can claim individually. So I'll finish with asking if sh I should develop this question further on. Should I include my fellow Linklater teachers in this unpretentious research? <laughs> can I free myself through my voice? What did others have experienced? What, what have others experienced? Is there an interest in pursuing this research, this quest? And why this question? I suppose it's because I cannot really promise my students that they will find freedom if they do the work. And that's what they might believe when they read the book. <laughs> <laughs> Can I suggest instead that they will discover, doing this work, they will discover more of their voice, that their voice will expand, be stronger, be supple, resilient, receptive, reflecting all the nuances of their thoughts, their character's thoughts. Thank you. So I, I suggest I do a little bit of practical yeah, verse work with, yeah. with uh, David, who is my very nice um, helper. So what I propose to do with David is just show you a couple of things we do, and it takes, of course, lots of time when we teach in a, in a class, so I'm not going to teach David this, but just show you how it works, if I can say that. But also show you something that's very important with the, the Linklater voice and with lots of voice practitioners, which is we use our hands in it, <laughs> right? To not, what is it for? Yeah, I let you judge of that. But it's really for the person to experience um, um, a witness of what they're living inside so that it's it's connecting them maybe more uh, precisely it's bring their attention to where i would like them or him or to to pay attention but it also it's also at some point i will move david's neck around for instance so you will see uh, what can happen so probably the first thing you want to do is uh well dropping down the spine because we had this extra attempt. no so i should yes in fact, I'm uh, right-handed, but that's fine. So let's, let's do this. You go there, and I go there. Yeah, it works. I could be on this little thing. Okay, yeah. So the dropping down the spine, and I hope you're not... Um, I hope you're not suffering as much as I was the first time Christine was uh, guiding, me, gui guiding me and the way I described it, because it's a real story. I was suffering so much. It hasn't focused. Shall we, shall we step out of frame? It's, ah. it's just the camera hasn't focused. There we go. Ah. It's trying to focus. Ah, okay. I don't see because I don't have my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm generally not focused at all. <laughs> <laughs> Just focus on you, so that's the important thing. <laughs> Alright, so the dropping down the spine that we probably all have done, but how we do it. I'm just going to invite you to let your head drop forward at the end of your next spine, and then Quite quickly, I'm just going to help you to feel those vertebrae drop one at a time and you'll be dropping down and I'm going to help you to release the muscles in your back and you're already sighing and I think people don't see much but that's all right, you're just behind. <laughs> okay. And I, I will do a gentle movement, holding, in fact you don't do not see it but that's okay. Should I move this? So that, uh, yeah, no, it doesn't help. Um. Yeah? That's okay. So roll, yeah, I'm just going to help you to roll back. Yeah? Roll back, roll back, roll back, roll back, roll back. Roll, 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 roll. And I'm holding your head back. And to have the, the real lengthening of the spine, I'm just encouraging you to lengthen the back of your neck as well. Then. Yes, that's it. How do you feel then? Does that feel a bit more? Yeah, a bit taller. A bit taller? Yes. Bit taller. <laughs> Just let the shoulders drop a bit. And 
Yeah, and, and, and then I will really put my hand somewhere on your stomach. Is that okay? Uh -huh. yeah. That's the way we pay attention to how the person will breathe. And I will encourage you to find a natural rhythm of breath. Yeah, so letting the breath out. Just tiny F. And if you wait, it drops back in and out again. There is what we call the natural rhythm of breath or of breathing. It's really kind of resetting of the starting point to observe breathing. Yes, that's pretty good. And from there, would you find a little bubble of sound? Because I was talking about um, I, I was talking about um, the feeling, the sensation of the voice in the body, right? So yeah, there is this image of your inner pool and from there a little bubble of sound huh, will bubble out huh. Huh, huh. Huh, huh. a double bubble and a triple bubble let your head drop down and drop down to your spine uh, and sign uh, uh, yes, yes, that's it. So we practice quite a lot of those sighs in different positions. So that's one other position. Uh, and can you next time you sigh with relief, shake your shoulder blades to free uh, Despite the anxiety of being witnessed by many people, can you really find a relief? Uh, yeah, a real uh, relief in your side. Uh, yeah, and bouncing your knees to free more vibrations, is it possible? Ah. Okay. Yes, 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 very nice. Okay. Ah. And roll that up. Ha ha. 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 And let your float on top. Ha ha. Yeah. And sign out now. Ha ha. <laughs> See, you can find a real relief. And shaking your torso might help. <laughs> a, a real open throat. <laughs> okay, keeping your tongue soft in your mouth. <laughs> and can you use your hand to show where the sound comes from and how it lands into your lips? You close your lips and then. Just share it with the audience here. Um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, just with one finger. Um, uh, um, uh, seeing the sound traveling through the room and hitting the end of the this little room. Um, uh, um, uh, one, two, three. One, two, three. And speaking a few lines of this <laughs> magnificent text. One, two, three. Just like if you were speaking to them, but also think that there might be more people out there. Yeah. I don't know. If poetry could take the pain away, it would begin with your last breath. Capture it, rewrite, reverse your life. I'll be holding you close to my chest, like an accordion watching my bellows of your lungs being pushed and pressed to hear one last sweet melody. Thank you. That's Roy McFarlane, mm -hmm. by the way. So we'll, we'll use it together. I should do this. Oh, no, we need it. We need it. I was going to just show the book no, of Roy, do you, do you know, so that yeah, people see course, it. Absolutely. Yeah, it comes from Roy McFarlane, a Midlands poet. And the, 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 it's called Beginning With Your Last Breath. And I'm smiling while I'm saying that. Okay. So how did that feel? Just, just exploring a little bit of sigh and yeah. bubbles and uh, sharing. <laughs> how was that? Uh, well, it felt relaxing and it felt um, more open than I, I was sitting there um, in my chair. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> how long have you been doing those little bubbles of sound, David, if I can um. ask? Maybe seven years now? Seven years? Yeah. What, <laughs> how do, what do you feel when you do that? Do you really connect to this image of the, the sound in the body? Can you yeah. feel, can you touch the sound, can you feel the vibrations in, your, in yourself? 
Yeah, I think I think one of it's always the first one is always the reintroduction to the the sensation. And I think after that, really envisioning a new imaginative space. Okay. With um with okay. each with each sound, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you, do you so you really recreate each time, mm. even if you're you're redoing the work for yourself. Yeah. It's never mechanical, isn't it? Yeah. It's really, this work is made for actors because you're creating and recreating what your, your research, your search all the time. I should be here, I suppose. Uh, you, so so it's, it's, it's an actor's experience, in fact. Yes, it corresponds to what we do as actors. It's not, I need to get, I mean, it, it could be I need to get there, but it's the journey you take. It's not thinking ahead to the result and knowing the result in advance. It's discovering what you're doing while you're doing it. So it's a constant research, like what actors do, really. Thank you very much. So would you stand up, and people who are online, I suggest that you have a, a piece of something uh, you could read afterwards, because I will distribute the text to the people here. So if you want to participate, you stand up. And I will, I will give everybody this text by Rob McFarlane. So whilst I'm doing that, just see if you have anything you can write, uh, or you can read at the end of this two minutes exercise, okay? So beginning with your, I'm giving you the text in So why don't you share this? I have some blue copies in case people need, um, need, um, yeah. I don't know if you, this text is going to pass I have a few copies. Oh, copies, yes. Yeah. But you can put on your chair whilst you're waiting, whilst we do the exercise. So, make sure you can stretch, right? Just stretch up and think of yawning. <laughs> See that? Whilst you yawn, your throat will open. <laughs> And then shake your body. <laughs> and think of a happy thought about. I mean, this is. A, I hope you're enjoying this experience. So I'm not going to say, "Oh, this is finally finished." Oh. <laughs> but just see if you could have a thought of something nice that could happen later today. Like you're gonna go eat or drink something, and. <laughs> your eyes if you're confident, otherwise keeping your uh, so focused, soft focus, focus, or your eyes half open, see if you could almost <laughs> or completely look inside of your mouth and have a picture of your throat. It's like this opening at the back of your mouth. And it goes down like in a tube. It is like a tube going down. It reaches your diaphragm, but if you keep looking down, you see your organs. If you keep looking down, you see maybe your pelvic floor. Maybe you see the inside of your legs. You see your feet and feel your weight and your connection to the floor for a moment. So check that your feet are well connected to the floor, that they're not too much wide apart, that they're not too close to each other, that you feel really confident standing like this. Then let your attention move back through your legs, all the way to the inside of your torso, and then up back, your picture in your diaphragm, if you have any idea where the diaphragm is, and then looking through the inside of your throat, through your mouth, and then open your eyes, and you're back into the room. So you've done this little inside, little visualization of your torso, your legs, right? Now, next time you're gonna close your eyes, I'm going to ask you to picture your spine. So this is a bit more complicated. But close your eyes and see if you could have a sense of your spine and this idea that your spine could be like a tree and that the roots of your trees are somewhere in your legs and they connect you to the floor in London, where you are, or wherever you are for the moment. Right? So you, you, you are a tree, right? So stay with that image for a little while. Are you breathing when you're doing that? Feel your long spine. Imagine that your ribs are like the branches of the tree. And bring your attention back 
a little lower where your diaphragm might be if you're not sure, put your hand on your belly. And you could in any case put your hand on, on your belly. And keeping your attention in, imagine that where your hand is or under your diaphragm, you have a deep pool, like a pool that you would find if you were going into the woods now. So inside of your torso exists a pool and next to this pool there is a tree growing and it's the tree of your spine but it is like a tree. And your tree is planted just next to the pool, this inside huge beautiful pool. And this pool is constantly renewed. The energy, the water comes through the roots that are grown and have grown into your legs and bring energy and water and, nourish and nourishment from the, the earth. So there is quite a bit of life inside of your pool and there is this beautiful tree growing there. Now the next little exercise I want you to do and using your imagination, imagine that you could see yourself standing next to that tree and you're looking at the pool so see a little miniature self inside the picture standing next to the tree and your feet are next to the pool and you're looking down at the pool and you see your face in the pool and you can smile at your own face in the pool and the pool is bright there is sun in the picture and of course you can see your lips opening and smiling gently and this beautiful deep forest pool is turned into the pool of your voice. So when you look down you see your voice there. And there is a little bubble of sound that is now born at the base of your pool deep down there and it's traveling through the pool and it's going to come and leave your pool through your lips, the lips you see in the pool but also your actual lip on a little huh. H-U-H sound. <laughs> and keep feeding this image. Each time there is a new image of the little bubble bubbling up. <laughs> and see there are two bubbles. <laughs> Picture the bubbles bubbling through and coming through your whole torso and out through your lips. <laughs> And maybe these little bubbles that are moving into your pool they are turned into a little laughter. <laughs> Even if it's a false laughter. <laughs> and then this little laughter is transformed into a spring of vibrations that starts deep down in your pool, travels through your torso and out your mouth. And Ah, wonderful. And using your hand, show the spring of your voice, the way from the inside of your body along your torso into your mouth and out. Ah, and you're going to open your eyes when you let your voice escape and draw your voice in front of you. Ah, Once your eyes are open, keep this image of the voice, the pool of your voice there. Now you're going to gather some of the vibration and give them to me. So you gather them on your lips, you feel the vibration buzzing on your lips, and then you open your lips, the sound escapes. that whilst you're reading, the story comes from deep down and through your voice and you give it to me all together, please. Use the text you've got. Did you get a copy of the text? Did you get a copy of the text? Can you share? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really. yeah. Yeah. yeah, see if you could, see if you could, see, yeah. see if you could just speak with that sensation of the sound coming from deep down. So what, I, if you are nice, if you can pick a, a piece of text and speak it with this sensation of the voice kind of coulé, 
Yeah, it's like it's it's running out of you. Try that. I see some people nodding. Could you feel a kind of spring of sound coming out of you? Um, yes, you could? It felt like I could bring the text down into that pool and then allow it to come out from there. Okay, somebody felt that they could bring the, the, the text in the pool and then express it from there. Yes, wonderful. Any other sensation of sound or image? Was it, uh, was it pleasant? People who don't do voice work ever? Was it pleasant? I see some people smiling or bizarre. Was it bizarre? It was very easy. Very easy, easy. You didn't have to push to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really what we're looking for at this stage. Easiness. Yes, a sense of, okay, I can just speak and it comes out. I don't have to think about anything. My voice is there to carry the text. Yes. I suppose that's all I wanted you to experience, no more than that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.